Used to keep it cool, used to be a fool All about the bounce in my step Watch it on the news, what you gonna do? I could hit refresh and forget Used to keep it cool So excited to see all of you here. This is a really special opportunity for us. So thank you, and um, we're gonna get on with the program. I'm Tacey Trowbridge. I head up Adobe's Global Education Programs team. And the purpose of our work is to inspire and empower students to be lifelong creators. And we've been looking most recently into jobs of the future. What do they look like? What are the kinds of skills that students will need? And that's the focus of our effort today. So I'm really thrilled to be joined by a panel, and I'm going to invite you to come up. Thanks. I'm going to kick off with just some general introduction. And the first is some questions for you to think about as we're going through this panel today. So the first is, what do you want your students to be known for? When they leave your classroom, what, what skills do they bring with them? How would somebody recognize that they've been in your classroom? Then how do these students demonstrate what they know and can do? And we've certainly got lots of standardized tests, but I don't know that that really captures who your students are and what they know and can do. And then finally, how are you preparing them for a rapidly changing world? As we look forward, we see a world where almost every industry you can think of is being disrupted in some way or another. Whether it's the manufacturing, it's automation issues, whether it has to do with medicine and the ways in which we're engaging with patients, that we see tremendous change. And students are entering a world where they're not quite sure what the future holds for them. They may very well end up in careers that don't exist yet today, and we can't imagine. And so one of the key questions is how do we prepare them for a world that we can't quite envision? So we also do a landscape scan and look at what are the kinds of things that we are seeing from the rest of the world in terms of the skills that matter. And what we've seen over the last few years is that the soft skills, what we call them soft skills, I think they're actually really the hard skills. They're the hard skills to teach, like creative problem solving, creativity, are showing up at the top of lots of these lists. And that's no accident, given the space that we're in. That if, we, if you are an organization and you're looking to continue to be relevant, you're going to have to reinvent yourself to figure out how to adapt in a new world. And you're likely looking for employees who are going to be helpful in that process, who can look at a situation, understand it, figure out which questions to ask, and be able to solve problems that they've never seen before. Then we're also hearing from hiring managers that they can't find the skills that they need. As we look at some of these really critically important skills, the four Cs, they are not finding students who are prepared, who are entering the workforce ready. Then we did a study on creative problem solving. Certainly, we saw that at the top of all sorts of lists. And so we surveyed 1,200 uh, students, policy, or educators, and policymakers to ask them, does, does creative problem solving matter? 97% said yes. So no surprise there. And here's some of why that they see that these skills are going to matter in terms of helping students go forward in a world which is increasingly automated. They also see that these kinds of skills are the skills that will help students get jobs where they can advance and where they have higher earning possibilities. So these are critically important skills. And I think there's some equity issues that we should think about. What are the ways in which we can ensure that all students have access to the opportunity to develop these skills? Now, you may ask why Adobe cares about this. There's no magic button in Photoshop that is creative problem solving. Maybe it would be nice, but I think that's exactly the point. That the people who are learning how to develop these skills are working on projects. They're creating things. They're making things. And we have a lot of tools that will help students do that. As we conducted this research, the educators who felt most confident that they were teaching creative problem solving skills were teaching digital media. They were teaching projects. They were doing project-based learning. So I think there's some really interesting opportunities for you as educators uh, as you consider the ways in which you can prepare your students for the future. We asked the educators, so what makes up creative problem solving? And they ranked the top three. And these are the skills that rose to the top. They want, their, they want students who can learn independently. If the world continues to change, we're going to have to find ways in which we can make sure that students continue to be lifelong learners. They know how to learn. They need to also be able to learn through success and failure, to have grit and persistence, uh, to work with diverse teams. And so as we think about what the world looks like and how uncertain it may be, these are really critical skills to prepare students to be successful. 
Then we also ask, so everyone agrees these are important skills. Are they being nurtured in schools today? And unfortunately, strong concern that they're not, that even though people value the individual skills and the general skills, it's really hard to do this in schools. And there are lots of reasons for that. It has to do with time, with professional development, that sometimes people are asked, being asked to teach in ways they didn't learn. They don't have great models for it. I, I was an um, English teacher and a history teacher myself, and one of the things I remember was that I made friends with the scheduler because I wanted to team teach with another colleague. And the only way I could make the schedule work is if I convinced this person to schedule us next to each other, both in terms of time and proximity. And so there's some structural things that make it really challenging within schools. And you can hack your way around them, but it's not always easy to do that. Interestingly to me, the policymakers and educators both agreed that creative problem solving should be integrated into the classroom. It should be part of the regular practice. When we ran a similar study about five years ago, it was much more about having creative skills taught in creative classes. And so I was really thrilled to see this focus on integration, that these are skills that everyone needs, regardless of the subject area. So this speaks to the what kinds of things can we do to change this that certainly individual teachers can make change within their classrooms, but it requires some systemic change, changes to curriculum. The answers, if you're learning creative problem solving, is not A, B, C, or D. It's going to have to be an answer that you come up with, that you create, that you pull together data, you come up with an interesting idea, and you propose a solution. That's, more, that's challenging to measure, and so you need some support in order to be able to do that. I was talking to Esther a little bit before the panel about the importance of parents, too that if parents have a perception, and I think this is particularly evident with the news about higher education in the last week and the admission process, that if we end up in a place where educators are trying, parents are really concerned about getting their kids into particular schools rather than teaching them the skills that they need or finding the best path for them, we're in a bit of trouble. So I think that there are some things to think about in terms of involving parents in this process as well that speak to some of the broader issues in education. We did a study where we asked Gen Z about how they learn and what's most important to them in the classroom. And 70%, 76% of them wish that there was more of a focus on creativity in the classroom. They also saw that 78% of them believe that the most effective way for them to learn is by doing and creating. When we ask how often they do that, 15% of the time. So we've got a huge gap between the way in which students learn, the kinds of skills that they need, and then the opportunities for them to really practice those. And this was an interesting one for me, too. 42% of students believe that what they learn outside of school is more important for their careers. And this is an interesting one. I think about it in terms of where students go to learn. They go to YouTube. They go to their social networks. They expect to learn in all sorts of places, not just in school. What it also highlights is their desire to have real world experiences, whether that's through internships or whether it's a project that has a real world application. That we see lots of schools who are making efforts to give students these kinds of opportunities or ensure that they're engaged in ways that help them prepare for a future. I don't know anybody expects to go into a career where they take tests for a living, but that's often where we're, what we're doing is helping students and we're measuring the impact of their learning based on a test rather than the application in the real world. I'm gonna, we're going to run this panel in a slightly different way. So I'm going to introduce the process too. We've got some really expert folks who have deep knowledge in different things. I'm going to ask each person to talk a little bit about their experience and then as a panel, join in. If you've got comments that you want to add to what someone else has said, feel free. We'd love to have this be more conversational. But I'm going to turn over to Laura first and give her a chance to describe some of the work she's done. Mm -hmm. This is a graphic that highlights um, eight of the really critical mm -hmm. design abilities. And so she'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so my name is Laura. I work at the Stanford Design School. I co-lead the K-12 lab um, in education. And uh, thank you. Uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, I myself uh, started as a classroom teacher in the, uh, in the South Bay of San Diego on the border um, in a comprehensive high school, 3,600 kids, 200 kids a day, 
you all might get what that's about. <laughs> um, and then I transferred and became a founding teacher of a school called High Tech High, which is a project-based, hands-on school, and was a principal of that school, um, as well as a teacher, and also helped get the graduate school of education going from there. Um, and I, Tacey and I were talking, and I think it's somewhat ironic for me um, that I run a design lab, because as an educator, I never really thought I was a designer. I taught. Right? I walked in, I taught my kids, and as over the years, as I really got into, I think, um, learning theory, um, experience design, is that I really realized, like, oh, I'm actually a designer. I have a locus of control in my classroom of space, experiences, emotions, content, that all are levers in my classroom to design experiential moments for students to discover themselves. And I think when we think about creativity, you know, obviously I run a design lab, and um, Esther knows that like the tagline is that is we like unlock creative confidence in people. And so, but I have a really firm belief that like everyone is creative. To be a mathematician today, you must be creative. You have to be thinking. When we think about creativity and we think about problem solving, there are solving problems today are no longer linear. <laughs> They're no longer simple. Every problem is complex, and it takes a really like strong lens to really think about outside of the box. Problems that are juicy and messy that have multiple solutions. And so for me, my experience has always been like realizing I am a designer. <laughs> in this way of really be embracing this idea like, whoa, I was never taught to be creative. I never thought I was creative. And then when I discovered design around ideation and prototyping, I'm like, wait a second. And so I, pu I put on the abilities, um, because for those of you familiar with design, um, it requires empathy. It's a process uh, that in involves empathy, defining, uh, prototyping, uh, testing. And it's a process that appears linear, but it's, it's actually not. Um, and we think a lot about at the, the D school about what design affords us, right? It's a process that actually, which we put up there, it says, what are the abilities that I will say, and, and Tacey, you said for students, but I would actually explicitly say that it's all of us in this room. Like, we, if we're going to ask our students to do it, we better be ready to do it, too, <laughs> and embrace ambiguity, embrace um, problem solving, embrace collaboration, even with colleagues you don't like, um, and really get into the messiness of, I see some people laughing up there, like, that's part of the work. And so we have to model the type of um, creative confidence and do the work with them. And so, you know, I put up the, creative, the design abilities, because I think all of them um, get to what it means to be creative and problem solving, but I think the one up there that really speaks to me the most right now um, is navigating ambiguity. Um, it's something when we're thinking about solving complex problems, they are rippled with ambiguity. And I think one thing as educators, and this is a challenge for all of us, is that I was taught as an educator to be in front of the room, I have content knowledge, I'm going to magically give it to you in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I think for us, as we embrace this type of work, I think there's a lot of self-identity work that we need to do to step back and say, like, I don't know, and navigate with students challenges that we don't know how to solve in community that has an ethical and equitable impact. And so that requires us to kind of let go of content. It requires us to like let go of our sense of like what it means to be a teacher today and be more of a facilitator, right? And wrestle with the problems with our students. And that there's some letting go there that I think we all have to do if we're all gonna embrace some of these abilities to allow our students to be um, creative in the world that really needs solving. Right now, there are so many problems that machine learning, AI, and things that students are gonna be required to do as part of their jobs um, in the future and now. And so how do we really help students not only solve problems, but solve them with an ethical and equitable lens, right? If we're really gonna help students particularly students who have been most marginalized in our uh, systemic system, we have to start interrogating the system that we're in and then really finding out who's been left out and how do we actually, they're already creative, but how do we actually make their creativity more visible to themselves and to others? And so for me, I think about these design abilities that I think line up to all the work y'all are doing at Adobe, right? And how do we have all these opportunities, micro and macro experiences that allow students to really find the creativity that's already in themselves. Um, and that means 
us letting go of what we think they really need to know and letting them discover it and having them do moonshots, right? <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's a tag right there. <laughs> Transfer, yeah. Well, that's, that's such an interesting perspective on this. I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Esther has a book we coming met out, each other. <laughs> uh, which we're super excited about on moonshots and education. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the things we heard from educators in this study was they, an educator in particular was talking about this shift from someone who taught content to teaching creative problem solving. And he described it really succinctly. He said, I went from being the person in the room with the answers to the person who created the problems. And what he meant by that was that he was designing assignments for his students where there was not a clear answer. And he wasn't guiding them to get to the answer, in, to get to an answer. He was just guiding them on the process of how to figure it out, which I thought was a really interesting way to describe it and just aligns with some of what you've said. I'd love to ask you also, like, what does this mean in K-12 education? We, I think there's also a process of helping co-discover the problems with students. You know, I think there's a little another leap there because one of the things that we're trying to do um, for K-12 is like really, I mean, a simple thing is like a very simple design problem in, in any school is who's being marginalized right now in your community? How are you gonna go out and observe and interview and engage and find out who's not being served by your system? And that is a design challenge that you can all start tomorrow, right? By shadowing students. And then for us, when I think about K-12, is like, what are the challenges that are, you know, that are really in front of every community, and how do we do the empathy work, interview people, observe, engage, and actually uncover what these challenges are really there, not presuppose what they are. And I think those, that becomes, for educators, I think it really requires us to become really good noticers and observers and ethnographic um, individuals to think about what is actually happening in my classroom. As someone who never thought of themselves as a designer, it's, I constantly see design challenges everywhere I go now. And so I think for us uh, in the classroom, it's like looking around the classroom and thinking, what do I want to redesign? Is it my, is my room, for example, is um, set up in rows? That's a design challenge. Right? If, how does that get communicated? If my room has nothing up on the walls right now, can I redesign my space? Can I redesign the lesson? Can I do empathy work with my students and start interviewing? All of those, I think, are actually small pieces that allow you, not because you're gonna change the system tomorrow, but they're actually small hacks that allow you to embrace an ambiguous process alongside of students. And you, I think those are small things you can do right now. Um, to start embracing design with students that doesn't require a whole lot of money, right? It doesn't require a whole lot of thinking. It just requires you to take a step back and say, like, what's going on here? Like, what am I seeing? What am I not seeing? What's invisible right now in my classroom that I really want to shed a light on and do something around it that's going to positively impact the students who need to he have that problem solved the most? So... You've created this really interesting program around shadow a student, and mm. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Mm. So um, the core, you know, for empathy work is really is, you know, when we think about really understanding design work and empathy work is really around understanding the needs of others. And so there's lots of things you can do in schools. You can go interview a student. And sometimes, depending on who you are, they may or may not tell you the truth, right? And so, yes. And so you may not actually know. And so um, one of the things that we've been doing for the last number of years is having a challenge. It's actually right around this time um, where we have educators and principals and community members go and actually immerse themselves in the day of a life of a school and a student and go get on the bus with them go to class with them, walk through their day. And it requires you to just sit in classrooms again. I did it last year. Um, I've done it many times, but last year I did it at a local school. Um, and it was fascinating. Um, one, I, there was no time to use the restroom. <laughs> Right? I was hungry throughout most of the day. Um, I couldn't talk to anyone. Um, and then there were some bigger challenges. The same, at the same day that we were there, um, my co-director Sam, they had a lockdown drill in, in the school. So here's a young person, you know, sitting down in the middle of a school day, worried about gun violence in school. And so the shadow of student challenge is really an empathy exercise to allow you to see what's kind of happening in your school from the student's perspective, right? Wait, I just want to say one thing. Great. So now you did this great study. Mm. What's 
are you doing to mm, change the that's system? Great. That's great. So we actually have a class um, that we're starting in two weeks around reimagining lockdown drills in schools. From that shadow experience, we did a lot of research right now. And so like, we're finding that is a huge problem in schools. Four million students last year in 2018 experienced a lockdown drill. One million of them were elementary, and 250 were el for students in kindergarten and, and like um, pre-kindergarten. And so that, right, is a system that's in school all the time. They're happening, I'm sure many of us in this room have experienced them. And yet we're trying to figure out what's another way to redesign that, to reimagine it, to actually reduce the trauma that's happening from those. And so we're doing that. And then there's a lot of educators who, from their own day, um, there's a wonderful teacher in Oakland who decided after her shadow experience that every time a student is suspended, she shadows the student instead. So instead of suspending them, she actually shadows the student to reimagine what her discipline program looks like. So there's educators all over thinking about what are the ways that the shadow can inform their next practice. Well, Esther, let's hear a little bit from you about the way, work that you're doing that's really rooted in schools and figuring out the best way to engage students and to transform classrooms and teaching. So um, what Laura said, you said a lot of really good things, Laura. So I think one of the reasons that the school is structured the way it is today is because of the testing. And everybody is worried about doing poorly on the testing. So the question is, how do we change that? Unfortunately, it's not going to come from the bottom up. I've already tried to do that. It's going to come from the top down. It's going to come when the community realize that this is not a good way to teach, and when they elect people to the school board that then support this. And right now, that's not happening. So, I mean, we're all talking about creativity, but you know, you cannot learn to be creative by watching someone else do it. You can't learn to be creative by reading a book about it. You can't, you can't learn to be creative unless you do it. You talked a little bit about like the, the um, atmosphere in the classroom. Maybe, you know, let's, sit, let's look at the classroom. Back, you know, when I first started, which was like a long time ago, feels like horse and buggy, um, all the desks were impossible to move. And actually, when I moved out of that portable into the Media Arts Center, the desks were like bricks. You, it was really hard to move them into anything else besides rows. So I think most teachers are stuck with that. I mean, we're lucky because now all of our desks are on wheels, so we can move it. And we have a, a lot of different uh, tables, so we can move that also. And so you talk about like what the teacher's gonna decorate the room like, right? Guess who decorates my room? The kids. And let me tell you, it doesn't always look so professional. <laughs> but it belongs to them. They decorate it. They actually, they do pretty much everything in the room, um, the way they want it to look, the way the class, they, they have input as to how the class is going to be structured for that 90-minute period. And um, they make a lot of mistakes, as you can imagine. But I never interrupt them in the middle of class, it's like, oh my God, what are you doing? No, I never do that. You know, I talk to them afterwards, like maybe that wasn't such a great idea, you know, what you did. So I think when you are encouraging creativity and encourage them to take a risk, you actually have to do it yourself in the classroom. And I think that's very hard as long as we're all being controlled by the test. And so we just saw this awful thing, the scandal that just happened in the last two weeks. And why do we have that scandal? It's because the test were, I mean, we had people that were fraudulently taking the test for kids. And universities that are accepting that as like the godsend, oh, here comes a kid with a 1600, you know. Um, so I, I think we re need to rethink the system why we're doing what we're doing. How happy are these kids? I, the, the group that I'm the sorriest for are the kids. Because what did it say to them? It said, my mom and dad did not believe in me enough 
to allow me to even take the test myself or to get into college myself. I mean, isn't there, I can't think of anything worse than having your parents not believe in you. And what are gonna hap what's gonna happen to these kids? I think most of them are going to be, um, you know, th they're not gonna be able to continue in the schools they are in. Because, you know, we, that guy Singer, he had a whole list of people. And it wasn't just in Palo Alto. It's all over the Bay Area. And while some of those names haven't been given out yet, at some point, everybody's gonna know. And they came from a lot of the private schools. They came from, you know, up and down the peninsula. It's pretty upsetting. So I think what we need to do is change the parents' view of what is an appropriate way for their kids to be educated in school today. And, you know, I'm happy to be here at Adobe um, because I think your products encourage creativity. I wanted to ask a little bit more about how um, you give students the opportunity to create and to learn creativity by doing it. Well, let's see. First of all, if you want to come to my class and see what chaos there is in the class, <laughs> you will be able to understand something about it. So I've been using these Adobe products since um, probably most of you were probably still in school at the time. Um, I was using Adobe products before it was called Adobe. It was called Aldous Corporation. And um, the only reason I was using it is because one of my students, his dad was an investor in Aldous Corporation. And he's like, he sent with his kid this little disc. And he's like, why don't you guys try this? And so it's like, ah, oh, that sounds good. You know, I didn't know how to do much of anything. So the kids were doing everything for the most part. But um, so it was back then that I realized how powerful my students were. And if I gave them the opportunity to do a lot of what I was struggling to do, that it would get done faster and also they would be empowered. So that's, that's where it all comes from. And, you know, we have today, you know, hundreds of kids in this program and six other journalism teachers and they all follow the same, exactly the same structure in their classes. If, if I walk in, the kids are in charge of the instruction and the teacher is kind of sitting in the back of the room and they're doing their creative things actually using Adobe products. So we have, as most of you know, about 11 different publications and they all are created using these products. They are a little bit more complicated. So, you know, in design, I'm sorry, is a little more complicated, but I'm excited <laughs> to learn more about Spark. And is it Rush? Yes. 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 Because I think, you know, all my students, all they want to do is make videos, you know? And they want to make the craziest videos you've ever seen, really. They will actually want me to do crazy things. So then they can post it of me doing crazy things. <laughs> So, so sometimes I'm cooperative, but sometimes I'm not. <laughs> but, but you know, I, everybody wants to make these videos. That, that was a moment for me I, when I was, as an English teacher, teaching the five paragraph essay, which is valuable, a good way to organize your thoughts, important to be able to express yourself well, but also insufficient for how we communicate today. I haven't written a five paragraph essay since I was in school. I've never convinced anyone of anything with a five paragraph essay. So while it's a helpful tool, I think we've also got to recognize the broader context. What are we preparing students for? And they need a broader set of skills. If your uh, Facebook feed looks anything like mine, the video has taken over everything. And so being able to tell your story, to create something, to give your students voice, to be able to tell their story yeah. is really powerful. So you had up here these slides, which I actually couldn't see too well. Um, but LinkedIn did a study in January and February where they polled a lot of their people to see what is the number one thing that employers are looking for, number one. And it was there, you had it highlighted, but it wasn't listed as number one. Creativity, that was the number one thing that they want their employees to have. And so if you have these kids sitting in classes for seven hours a day, okay, so you track them and you shadow them. The question I have is, now you know they're suffering through seven hours a day of direct instruction, now what are you gonna do about it? 
And um, so if you let them take charge of some of their learning using these um, technical tools we have, you know, so instead of lecturing about something, have them go online and find out about it. Then have them, they can write about it, or they can do a blog about it, or they can, you know, um, there's so many different things they can do. That, and then that, they learn to collaborate, they learn, um, you know, to communicate effectively with each other, all these skills that we're all looking for. Um, but, you know, I have to sympathize, because, right, I've been a teacher for all these years, 36, and I can just tell you, I know the pressures. And so, you know, I think it's like, oh, that's why I started this, right? The moon, globalmoonshots.org is the movement that we're doing, and Kim Diorio, I'm very happy to say, is the COO of this organization. And the goal is to change the way we teach just 20% of the time. And so if we can just do it a little bit and people can see that that works, maybe then they'll change it to 30% and maybe to 40%, who knows? But just 20% of the time, give kids an opportunity to do projects instead, instead of a test. Let's see whether they can use what you've taught them to do, create a project of some kind. And I mean, the kids will be thrilled. Well, Esther, thank you so much for sharing your practices <laughs> and, and your vision of what this can look like. And also, it sounds like an open invitation to come visit your school, too. Yes, you're welcome <laughs> to come to the school. Great. Well, we're going to shift to Patrick, uh, who can, who's going to reflect a little bit on his experience of moving from school, classroom, and into work, and look at what that journey has been like. So, Patrick, I'm going to hand it over to you to tell us a little bit about your history and your path. Yeah, of course. Um, so, right now, I am a, a marketer at Adobe. I started about nine months ago through Adobe's uh, new university hire program. Uh, I, I did come out of an MBA program, um, and prior to that, I was working uh, in an advertising agency in Chicago. Prior to that, I was an undergrad, and prior to that, I was in classrooms, uh, in a classroom, uh, like many of you sit in front of or amongst uh, every day. Um, and when Tacey asked me to come um, speak on this panel and be a part of this conversation, um, I was asked to do something that I don't do too often, which is reflect on kind of what my high school experience was like and um, what that foundation looked like, um, and I, I think of it as a foundation to get to where I am now. Um, and I, I, so I, I grew up pretty far away from here. I've only lived in the Bay Area for, for about a year now. Um, I grew up in, in the middle of Iowa uh, and went to high school there for, um, and, and grade school there as well. Um, and, and I would say I grew up with kind of a, a, a split academic personality. I, I, I thought I was, you know, some months I thought I was this, this kind of math and quantitative kid, and I, I went to some math club meetings. It was very much like the lowest performing math club student, but still really liked it. Um, and then some months I was really into writing and really into um, you know, the drama club and, and joining the school play. And I kind of saw these as two separate worlds and couldn't figure out how to, how to reconcile them um, and never really made an effort to and um, didn't have an, an outlet to do that. Um, I, saw, I saw it as kind of an either or decision. Either it's like, okay, I, I either go really deep on understanding the numbers or I go really deep on becoming a writer. Um, and, uh, and I still kind of wrestled with that in, in uh, applying to schools. So when, I, when it came time to apply to, to, uh, to university, I, I think I applied to a different major at every school that I applied to. And I don't recommend this to, for, for anyone um, <laughs> going forward. Um, when, I, when I finally have kids, I'll say, please pick, pick something. Um, but I applied to different schools and said, OK, like, we'll leave this in, in, in the hands of fate. Um, so I, I was you know, pre-med at the school, and economics at the school, and English at the school, and I said, I'll, I'll figure it out later. Because um, I, I, I believe then, and I still believe, like, it was, it's really hard to decide what you want to be when you're 17 or 18 years old. Um, and I, I think I, this probably resonates with a lot of you. Like, I still don't know what I want to be, but like, I know what I care about, and I know the skills that I want to build, and I know um, the kind of people that I want to surround myself with. Um, so anyway, I ended up getting into the school that wanted me to study economics. Uh, so I did that, but then I sort of supplemented that side of my brain with what I saw as the more qual qualitative or creative side and filled my electives with writing and English. And, 
you know, was really close to switching my major to be an English major at one point. My, my mom was like, well, like, why don't you just go write for the Wall Street Journal? That's like bringing the two of those together or, or Bloomberg Magazine. And I was like, okay, yeah, um, sort of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, she's like, that, that would satisfy both sides of, of the equation, right? I was like, yeah, of course. Um, but then, I, you know, I got, I got to the point where I needed to apply to jobs and I started to think about, okay, how do I actually bring both of these together? Um, and, and I, I, I want to say I was really intentional about this, but based on what I've just told you, you know that I didn't have a lot of intention to begin with. Um, so I, I was looking for um, something, s somewhere that I could bring both of these together. <laughs> somewhere that I could bring both of these sides of my brain together, and I, fell, I sort of fell into this role in digital advertising, and it was, it was perfect. It was, um, it was a role where they were asking me, you know, working with Adobe Analytics on, on most days, um, asking me to understand how marketing campaigns were performing and um, measuring that and sort of telling a story around that. But then, you know, after that, you have to think about, okay, what's the next campaign and sort of informing the insights that will go into much more creative conversations. Um, a lot of it ties into the things that, that, um, that Esther was talking about in terms of thinking about design thinking and thinking about, you know, what does the customer care about and how, how you stay curious about, about the customer. Um, and, and I got to kind of the, the, the tail end of that portion of my career um, and moved into a program that was focused on um, my, an MBA plus design innovation. I was like, okay, this is the perfect way to kind of go all the way with um, bringing together the, the quantitative and the creative sides of my brain. Um, and and the, the skills that I kind of built there that I, I want to emphasize um, were, you know, thinking about um, the ability to wear different hats. Um, what, you know, all the way from high school, wh whether I knew it or not, um, all the way from high school through my graduate program, um, thinking about kind of the ability to adapt, um, the ability to move from the big ideas to the execution, um, the, the sort of like ability to stay curious and, and um, always be thinking about, you know, what's next. Um, and, then, and then I think storytelling. Um, you know, we live in this world where we're, we're kind of shown all this data all the time and asked, okay, what do you make of this? Um, what should we do next? But um, a, lot of, a lot of what I'm asked to do now and what I've been asked to do throughout my career is to take, take the data and actually tell a story around it and be able to convince people of, of a point of view. Because um, anyone can kind of take a look at the numbers and, and, and make their own uh, assumptions or, or own conclusions on it. But if you can't tell kind of a compelling story around that data, um, you, it, it's tough to convince or move anything forward. Um, so those are the skills that I, I kind of want to emphasize that I, I learned throughout my, my academic journey. But um, the, the one thing that really resonates with me and um, for, from earlier in this panel is this idea of letting go of what we need to know. Um, so when I think about gaps in my, in my academic background, background I think um, in high school and in university to some degree, the, the education, and I promise I'm not stealing any of your content, like this, this is very much in my head um, when I was thinking about, uh, about my own experience, but it's like my, my high school experience especially was so focused on here's the answer, um, you know, or here's, here's the question, How, get to the answer. You know, that, that's sort of the, 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 the learning outcome is, is answering the exact question that, that we're given. But then I, I got into the real world, whether it's in the, the advertising business that I was working in or in, uh, at Adobe now, and they're not hiring me, um, at least I don't think they're hiring me, to, to answer a specific question. They're hiring me to figure out exactly what the question is. And that's a much more involved process and takes kind of a different skill set. Um, so I think uh, while, while high school and, and, and college to some degree instilled kind of a, a base level foundation in terms of like curiosity to figure out what the question is, the, the tasks themselves, once, once I drill into like the day to day in terms of uh, what was assigned by, by my teachers back then, um, didn't necessarily align with, with the skills that I need now in terms of finding out what the exact question is. And I think that's where, um, where design thinking fits in really well. And um, the, the process of understanding the customer, the process of staying curious, the process of thinking about um, what the customer needs and not assuming the question or assuming the answer too early, to sort of stay open to the possibility of multiple solutions that can live in, in an existing space, to prototype the solutions, to, to test them against, um, against different audiences. Um, 
So I, th I think I'll end it kind of there um, in terms of my background, but uh, Tacey, if you have any follow-up questions, we can, we can dig into that as well. Well, thank you, Patrick. I really appreciate your reflection. And I, I think as I listen to you talk, I also realize you've ended up in working two different jobs that probably didn't exist when you were trying to figure out what you wanted to do. And, and yet you are come into it with the kind of skill and knowledge that help you be successful. So congratulations. That's a hard thing to do. And I think a really nice segue to Ginny and the work that she is doing at LinkedIn in recruiting. Um, and so we'd love to have you share some of the trends that you see, what are the skills that really matter, sure. um, and what you see in the future as well. Yeah, well, first, thank you so much for letting me be part of this. This is so interesting to listen to you, all you three, and I, I feel like it's so relevant. And this is a topic that I care a lot about. I spend my day uh, doing this. I'm at LinkedIn, and I... Um, specialize in bringing in talent for the design organization, um, which comprises of UX designers, animation designers, UX researchers, writers, um, so really the creative space within LinkedIn. Uh, I also have a passion for young talent. Um, I have a passion for matching talent to opportunity. Um, and I also have, uh, well, what I think a lot about is high potential. Um, I think about talent. I'm, I think about like, why are, why do people have high potential? Growth mindset, why do some have growth mindset and others don't? How did that evolve in time? Um, because I see and we hire some really high, high performers and, um, and sometimes we don't and we don't always get it. Of course, in my work, that's what I try to do. I try to bring in all the high performers. So I spend a lot of time, um, I'm very lucky, in the work I do, I get to spend about 25% of my time in the university space where I get to talk to uh, design students. And, um, and the timing of this discussion is perfect. I just completed all of our intern hiring and um, new college grad hiring for the season. And so visiting the schools and the students, you know, I start talking to students at their freshman year and I, you know, end up hiring them around junior year senior year. And I know right away at that freshman year level if they've got it. And what I look for, and we've been talking a lot about this, is, um, and that freshman doesn't know how to really do product design. But they may not even know what product design is. And it's really interesting to actually see that they don't. Um, and they could be, you know, majoring in fine arts or whatever it might be. But it's this thinking that they have that is unique. And it's the design thinking. It's the creative thinking. And it's looking at a problem and coming up with the solution in a way that generally blows my mind when I'm watching it and looking at it. Um, and then their ability to describe the project and walk me through it. And being able to be very succinct about it be able to, um, I don't know, just share it with me in a meaningful way. Um, and then there's these like really soft skills that I can, I can see. So when I'm hiring at LinkedIn, both you know, inexperience and experience, I will share some of the things that really stand out for me and for the team. And we actually um, just recently did a brainstorming session with a lot of the design leadership and managers and just kind of like, what is it? Like, you know, when we're looking at a lot of very high successful people that are there at LinkedIn, what is it? And we all came down to one thing, and it's persuasion, which is kind of interesting. I, I thought of all sorts of different things. Um, the ability to persuade, but we can look at that in many different ways. And so I, I would put that in the category of storytelling. Um, and storytelling um, is, you know, when we're looking at young talent at, at, at any age, is showing their piece and being able to describe it and in some ways persuade. And then also standing up for the work that they've done. Right. Um, those are traits that are, are quite valuable. And, and every high, high performer seems to have that trait, which is really um, interesting. And of course, there is this, uh, when I think of um, anybody, 
it's, you know, any talent that we bring in, I've, I've kind of bucketed in three categories. I have skill, we have knowledge, and we have mindset. And I always, when I coach hiring managers and businesses, just hone in on the mindset. Because the skills and the knowledge, you can teach. Adobe has amazing, amazing products. Um, and they keep getting better and better. And with that, that skill is going to constantly change. So what we see today is going to be much different in two years. So I don't worry about that stuff. But what I can't teach is this great communication, this adaptability, this flexibility. So when I think about, and I peel it back a little bit further, um, is when I think about some of the students that, kind of, that come in and they present and then they're showing me their work. And some of the stuff is completely not relevant to what we're doing at LinkedIn. Um, and I, I give them 10 minutes to kind of tell me their story. How did they get to where they are today? Because I, I want the audience to see it. And those that I know are my, what I would call my kick-ass designers, my high performers, are the ones that were able to study creative throughout their life and go into metalwork, go into weaving, go into drawing, chalk, any kind of creative space. Um, and, and, you know, I think about this one person, she worked with metal, and she was able to connect metal, and is it called solder? Not called solder, it's, it's a weld the metal together. And every piece that she puts in will make another piece move. And what she is learning is like, this piece affects that piece, and then that piece, and that piece. That's user experience design right there. And although she's using metal, she's learning this way of thinking that is incredible. So when I talk to all of you, which honestly, this is a privilege, and, and I talk to a lot at the university level, and I haven't spent any time at the high school level, which I would love to, when I think about like how does that translate in the classroom, as I think about giving the student the problem without these constraints, without the tip of the hat and what the solution is, and telling them, like, the sky's the limit. You can spend as much money. Your budget is as big as it is. What would you do? Um, rather than, like, design me this water bottle, and it needs to hold cold water. You know, design me a water system that anybody can get water anywhere where they want to get. What would they come up with? Um, and just giving that freedom, that space to really think, I think helps those really creative thinkers, um, which down the road will help this, this person that I look for, this, like, this deeply creative um, thought leader. So that's what I think about. And then I also think about what's going to happen in five to 10 years from now. What are things going to look like? So I just want to say that one thing that we're all going to look for in five to 10 years is we're going to be looking for things that computers don't have. So they have no empathy, no compassion, no creativity. And those are the things we should be concentrating on. And they say the way that you can predict a kindergartner and how successful that kindergartner will be in life is not by the number of uh, how much math they know or how many colors they know or all that. It's all social emotional skills. And it's just what you said. You know, you can teach them something like, you know, knowledge just of some kind, skill and knowledge. but you cannot change their social emotional skill Absolutely. capabilities. You now, what I see a lot at the college university level is they create groups where they're on a design project. Um, and what that teaches them is this collaboration and negotiation and persuasion um, and working with others that are not like them. Right. And it, it challenges them. Um, and so in the classroom, you know, I imagine, I do have a high schooler, she's a freshman. And I think like if she was in that environment, she would want to be with her friends and they're like-minded folks, but I would separate them so they're not with the like-minded folks. So they're learning to, to listen to another point of view, to collaborate, to negotiate, 
um, and then to problem solve as, together. And there's a lot of social skills that are developed there as well. I thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. And each of you have really contributed some important ideas and perspectives around this. So one of the things that we try to do at Adobe is, is highlight and spotlight best practices so that it's educators sharing to educators mm -hmm. the kind of work that's happening in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. And it could be an example of a lesson. It could mm -hmm. be a sample of what students have mm -hmm. created. We offer free professional development. These are courses mm -hmm. that are taught by educators mm -hmm. for educators. They're avail we offer pretty much one a week throughout the year. There's some coming up mm -hmm. on Rush. So if you get excited about mm -hmm. Rush and want to continue and see what that practice looks like, mm -hmm. come join us. Mm -hmm. This is a platform where we have 14,000 different learning resources. 10% of them are created by Adobe, 90% mm -hmm. by educators. Mm -hmm. And so part of what we're really trying to do is just showcase the practices. Mm -hmm. And so I think your point about language is really mm -hmm. important. Your point about access and who we're teaching is really mm -hmm. important. And we're probably not the best speakers mm -hmm. to do that. And I mm -hmm. think that's a point well taken. Mm -hmm. What we're also trying to do is highlight the teachers who can mm -hmm. share those mm -hmm. messages, who are yeah. teaching a hugely diverse set of students. Mm -hmm. As I think about one of the examples I love of teaching creative problem solving, it was a middle school student um, outside of Chicago. And she was teaching in a school where the school was surrounded by vertical bars all the way around the school. This is a middle school. This, their surrounding community called these students jailbirds. The students deeply offensive. Like this was not, this categorized them in a way that they were really uncomfortable with. The problem they wanted to solve was how do they change the way the community sees them. Mm -hmm. And so they went to their English teacher and their art teacher and said, help us figure this out. Like, mm -hmm. This is a problem we want to solve. And they took uh, portraits of, of themselves and wrote text on the portraits that described something deep about who mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. and essentially created an exhibition that they used within the school mm -hmm. to build some of the power mm -hmm. and then also to share that with the community. Mm -hmm. So the community saw these students not as like the yeah. noisy middle school mm -hmm. students who are coming and throwing trash mm -hmm. on the way to school and go to school behind bars, but saw them as real people yeah. and what was important about them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, th I think there are lots of examples like this yeah. of educators who look at a who find a problem or students mm -hmm. who come up with here's mm -hmm. the challenge that mm -hmm. we have that we want to mm -hmm. solve mm -hmm. and find an educator who's mm -hmm. willing to engage mm -hmm. and to help think through how does this tie to curriculum mm -hmm. what's the way in which this can support my teacher my students learning for the kinds mm -hmm. of skills that they need and also mm -hmm. the kinds of things that I'm supposed to be teaching them mm -hmm. so I love Mitch Resnick so I love this quote that Learning should be about giving students the opportunity to use new materials, to design, create, and most importantly, develop as creative thinkers. So we've talked to you about some ideas, gotten some questions, hopefully sparked some interest for you. Thank you all so much for being here.